thanks so much for stopping by. I really hope that you enjoy this message that you are about to watch and that the Holy Spirit would help you get something out of this. Well, good morning. Um, I uh, was preparing for today, and I had uh, an idea in mind of what I wanted to talk about, and then God decided to flip that on me. So I thought I was going to cheat the system a little bit, and uh, I'm teaching tomorrow night in the School of Leadership, and uh, so I'm, I'm doing a message on uh, victor or victim mentality, and um, I thought I would use a portion of that uh, this morning to do a, uh, a message on self-worth and, you know, how God looks at us and, you know, how we look at ourselves and, and um, no. So um, actually what I'm, I'm speaking on this morning, it's the, the title of my message is The Ever-Widening Circle. And uh, I thought as we're coming into 2019, uh, we need to start looking at, at what our senior pastor has uh, in store for us this year. And um, you know, what we're going to start doing and, and getting outside of these four walls and what we've been called to do and, and reaching our community. And uh, so that's what that's uh, kind of tailored to this morning. So uh, let's just open up in prayer and see where we wind up. So, Father God, we just thank you, Lord, this morning for the message that you were about to bring. I just thank you, Father, that you are going to take and, and use me as a mouthpiece, Father, to deliver the word that you have called forth at this time for this body. We just thank you, Lord, for the way that you're going to use us in this community, Father, to touch hearts, to touch minds, and just open everything up to your word, Father. We just thank you, Lord. We know that in the end, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Father. Father, we just pray that we just, that that soil that we need to plant that seed in is just softened and opened up, Father. We just thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So um, I noticed this going on. Somebody pointed this out to me um, that when I'm up here speaking, and I don't know why. I don't know if it's because my hands start to get a little bit sweaty, and I, I tend to do this. And uh, my wife said, don't do that. You look like you're scheming. <laughs> it's not intentional. Uh, thank you, Brittany, for pointing out that I do that. Um, I will try not to do that. I make no guarantees. But funny thing along that line, we were talking about DNA and, and all of that. I was at my parents' house um, you know, over the holidays here, and I was talking to my dad, and my dad said, so what is it you're going to be teaching about? And I was telling him, and he had a piece of, of thoughtful information to go into what I was going to be teaching on tomorrow night. And as he began to tell me what he had, you know, this philosophical idea that he had in his mind, and he was going deep, he was doing this. <laughs> and now I can't help but notice when this goes on. So now I know what my dad's tell is, you know, when he's about to tell me something that's really deep, it's going to, he's going to be, you know, doing that. So I apologize. I need some deodorant for my hands. <laughs> it will be good. So now see, I don't want to understand. They told me when I was a kid growing up not to do this. I got in trouble in the army for doing this, for putting my hands in my pocket. You know, I always got in trouble for this. Hands were in the pocket. So if my hands are in my pocket, what am I supposed to do with them? <laughs> right here, right? Right here. All right, I make no, no apologies. All right, so we need to understand that with God, all things are possible, right? Amen. So it's best to dream the impossible. There's a musical, I don't know if you're all familiar with it or not, called The Man of La Mancha. And in that musical, Don Quixote is the dreamer of impossible dreams, right? He's the lover of those that refuse to love him back. And he's the tilter at windmills. I, 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 I heard that phrase, and I thought, what in the world does that mean? And it's best described as the attacker of imaginary enemies. I mean, he saw things like the, the windmill was a dragon, you know, and he, he had to take that on. So his sidekick was Sancho Panza, now, the thing about Sancho is that he never dreamed of something better. He never thought or imagined coloring outside the lines. And that's like so many of us in the church today, that we're just content to muddle along, you know? 
Now, you might have been clapping when I came up here. I hope you're clapping when I leave because things might, might get some, so, some sore toes here. So, you know, we're, just, we're content to just muddle along, barely surviving. But we need to be a church full of Don Quixote's. You know, we need to be dreaming the impossible dream. We need to be, uh, we need to dare to take on the world and just shake it till it rattles. You know? We need to help people reach their God-given potential. And we need to thrive on the inherent risks of the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. What does that mean? Well, we're going to get into that. We need to join together with what would seem to be an impossible mission and grow this church from this small body right here to a church of thousands. Why? Not to glorify ourselves, not to just build up a big you know, institutional church. It's so that we have workers. We have a dying city around us. And the only way that we're going to be able to tackle that impossible mission and that impossible task is to get the workers in the house. I mean, right now we, we uh, have, you know, people working in the back that are always working in the back, you know, with the kids. Um, there's barely any rotation going on back there with those kids because we just need more workers. We need more people in this house. And the only way that we're going to get them, well, there's two ways. One of them I don't like. I don't want to cherry pick existing Christians from other churches. That's not what we're called to do. We are called to seek and to save that which is lost. So that's how we need to grow this church. We need to get out there and start talking to those people that need Jesus. We need to show them who they need. We need to show them who they are and whose they are. So... I know, I know we, we think it seems like it's an impossible mission, but Philippians 4.13 tells us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Do we believe those words? Do we live like we believe those words? That's an important question. So let's talk about the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. I want to look first at the great commandment. If I could have the booth put up, Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Now this is when uh, some of the Pharisees or teachers of the law had, they were trying to pin Jesus down on something and, and get him to say something wrong. And they asked him, they said, teacher, what is the most important commandment? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In other words, what he's saying is, is that if we keep those two ideas in mind, the Ten Commandments themselves won't be an issue. That covers all ten. We don't have to sit and remember all ten commandments and quote them like we're in preschool and, or you know, back in, in Bible school and uh, know every single one of those in order and what they all mean. Because if we just keep those two in mind, all the rest will fall underneath that. So let's look at the Great Commission. And, you know, we find that in, in Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And this was after his resurrection. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I want to look at that 
passage, that length or that period of time also here in, in the book of Mark, chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, a lot of times what we overlook in those passages is the news that they were to be carrying. And we just focus too much on get them saved, get them saved, like it's a factory. But the message that went along with that, the good news that they were to be bringing was the, was the message of the kingdom, kingdom living, kingdom life. What does the kingdom entail? That's the message that we're supposed to be taking out. Yes, we need to go out and get them saved, and we need to get them into the kingdom. So how do we do this? Well, we need to look at the book of Acts for a blueprint. It chronicles the birth and the spread of the church, you know, throughout the known world. And, and now many think that, that Luke uh, was the author of the book of Acts. There's a couple of reasons. One, they both start off being addressed to Theophilus. And uh, Theoph- Theophilus in the Greek literally means loved by God but it carries the idea of friend of God. So it's, it's thought possibly that that's just a generic title for all Christians. But from the context of both Luke and Acts, we can see that it's actually written to an individual. But, you know, uh, even though this message is also intended for all Christians in all centuries... It was, it was purposed right at that time to one individual. And, and the, the book also makes the statement, in my former book. So that leads us to believe that Luke wrote the book of Acts. And the reason I say, I bring all this up is that Acts can be considered the continuation of the book of Luke. And if we look at the last chapters of Luke before we get into the book of Acts, Jesus is on the road to Emmaus. And he's with two travelers who don't recognize him. It said that he hid, his, uh, he hid himself from them. He basically blinded their eyes to who he really was. And it says as he eats dinner with them, his visage or his identity is revealed. So the significance of traveling to Emmaus is because it was a mostly Roman garrison, a Gentile town. One of the last remembrances of Jesus in Luke's gospel is of him moving away from Jerusalem, away from the temple, away from the Jewish world, away from religious professionals toward the Gentile world. That's like you and me moving away from the comforts of this church, from this building, from our way of doing things, and getting out into the community around us and into the the world around us and reaching the people around us. We're getting away from our man-made doctrines into the world of the unchurched, the de-churched, and the never-churched. So Luke is the story of Jesus' life, while the book of Acts is about the church that carries on the life of Jesus. So when we get into the book of Acts here, chapter 1, verses 4 through 9, can have that up. On one occasion while he was eating with them, this is during the time period, the 40 days after he reappeared to them, that he continued to talk with them and teach them about the kingdom. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria 
and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So those were the last words that Jesus spoke to the disciples who were about to become the apostles before he left. That's what he left them with. That was their last assignment. So Acts is about the spread of the church, which can be summarized by Acts 1.8, right there that we just read. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And this is referred to as the ever-widening circle. We aren't called to take care of ourselves or build a huge institutional church. We are called to transform the world, beginning right here in our city and spreading throughout the state the nation, and the world. Can you put up that diagram for me? So to give you a little visualization of this, I had Heather put this together for me. You can go to the next slide. It says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. At least I think that's what that says. I can't read that from here. (laughs) But that, you know, so let's, let's translate that over. What does that mean? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Ha, Newark. In all Licking County. And Ohio. And to the ends of the earth. You can leave that visual up there for just a minute. You will be my witnesses in Newark, in all Licking County and Ohio, and to the ends of the earth. Now, some people look at that that word, and, and they try to translate it to then, Like, well, we can't do any of these until we touch that first circle. My witness is in Newark. Well, until we touch Newark, we can't go to Licking County. Well, until we hit Licking County, we can't go to Ohio. Well, in the Greek, the actual word there is chi, which doesn't mean then. It's the Greek word for and. Yes, we need to be touching Newark, but that doesn't mean that we can't be reaching out at the same time and touching Cuba. I've heard it criticized that we're reaching out to the nations. And while, yes, you know, while reaching out to the nations rather than our own city, and while there may be some truth to that, maybe, it doesn't mean that we can't. We can be taking these missions trips, and we need to, because we're going to pick up things and learn things off of those. But at the same time, we can't sit back as a church body and say, well, I don't have the money to go to Cuba. I'm not able to go on this trip and not do anything about right where we're at. Maybe you're not called to go on one of those missions trips, but you are called to right here. We're all called to right here. You know, I'm even guilty of this myself. You know, it scares me to death. They talk about going out to Tent City and to... And to where you've got, you know, the homeless population and, and the things going on with the drugs. You know, I've got two nephews. One is in rehab right now and is doing phenomenal. And he's got a call on his life, I'm telling you. He's, he's doing really well. But I have a hard time talking to those people. I don't know how to relate. I just don't. And it scares me to death. But, you know, the, the thing that, that we're the most scared of is most likely what we're called to do. You know, Chris Gargas makes trips out to Tent City. Um, Larry Miller, I don't know if some of you know Larry. He's with More Life right now. And um, I say that like he's not going to be there. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it that way, like we're calling him in. Um, No, Larry's phenomenal. But they they do that. They'll pack up a backpack full of things and just take out to Tent City and just love on these people. 
Blessings on them, it scares me to death. I think Pastor Jeff and I kind of feel the same way, not to throw you under the bus, but there's, you know, I, I, I don't want to feel alone up here. So, all right, so back to the message. I'm digging deeper. There are four truths that we should try to live by. Truth one is it's all about Jesus. The goal of a real church is not to be an institution with charters and rules and regulations. The goal is to bring people under the lordship of Jesus. Having a deep and personal relationship with Jesus is the ultimate goal of Christianity. Everything else, it's just window dressing. You know, we, it, between, in the churches, we start to get into these, these arguments over this belief or that belief. Those are non-salvation issues. Our main worry in this is about getting people saved and into the kingdom of God. When Christ is the head of the church, the petty stuff disappears. It just disappears. When people live under the cross, they don't have time to sweat the small stuff. Jesus said, you shall be my witness. In 1 Corinthians 3.11, Paul said, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus. In Acts 4.12, Peter preached in one of his sermons, Salvation is found in no one else. Truth number two. The only way to know the limits of our possibility is by pushing through them to the impossible. The only way we can succeed is if God intervenes on behalf of the mission. Are we willing to do whatever it takes to push through the limits to possibility? Truth number three, it's in the impossible that God profoundly confronts us. You know, it wasn't until Peter stepped out of the boat that he understood the true weight and power of God. Had he not been willing to step out of that boat, Just think about what he would have missed out on. What we would have missed out on. Truth four. Great Christians are never content with anything, at least not until the kingdom comes on earth. We must develop a holy discontent for the status quo. Contentment has to become a four-letter word. An author by the name of Peter Drucker said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. The best way to create, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And that's exactly what God wants to do here. Create the future. For him to create the future that he has in store for us. He doesn't want to see our work fail. He wants to see us transform this city. You know, if our vision isn't big enough to scare us, then it's too small. If it isn't so big that there is no way we can accomplish it on our own, it isn't God's vision. It's a goal. Let me say that again. If it isn't so big that there's no way we can accomplish it on our own, it isn't God's vision. It's a goal. Let me restate it. If we can do it on our own, it's a goal. If we can accomplish it on our own, it isn't from God. I'm not saying he doesn't call us to do some small things, but we're talking in the light of transformation. God is found most fully in the impossible. Every vision in the Bible comes from an individual, not a committee. Search it out. 
We, we try to form these committees and sit around and throw things around. And, and while those might be good tools for problem solving, for figuring out how we're going to make the vision come to life, how to make it work, those committees aren't where we get the vision from. I read a statistic uh, from 2010 that said 80 to 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent of all established churches in North America are at risk. They're in need of resurrection, restart, turnaround, or going missional. One of the reasons churches are declining is because they are run by committee instead of vision. Fortunately, we have a vision. We need to implement it, but we have a vision. A vision that's based on our calling. We are called to be an apostolic sending center. Maybe we don't all understand what that means yet. But that's what we're called to. Pastor Osway's got a great vision for that. And I'm sure in the next several months... We're going to get into this a lot further and a lot deeper. But in order for us to fulfill this calling, it's going to take some real transformation. We're going to need to get behind Pastor Josue's vision and be willing to do whatever it takes to get to what God is calling us to. If any of the three following ingredients are missing, transformation doesn't happen. The three essentials in transformation are, one, the Holy Spirit, two, transformational preaching, and three, and the most important here, well, I don't want to say the most important because Holy Spirit was one, but it won't matter if we don't have committed people. Number three is committed people. If nobody's committed to the vision, it's not going to happen. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, it's not going to happen. If we don't have Pastor Josue's vision and his transformational preaching towards that vision to get people on board and pumped up, it's not going to happen. It's going to take all three of those things. So we need to read and study the book of Acts. That's our blueprint. We need to support one another in a covenant as we grow. My dad had an analogy years ago that he had shared with me, and I had to go back and ask him about it because it, it, it was, God was bringing it to my mind, but I couldn't remember all of the words to it. And uh, so he shared this analogy with me again, and I want to read it to you. And I'm, he was on the phone, but I'm sure his hands were doing this. <laughs> um, and, and this analogy went like this. The church is like a ship, And the preacher is the captain, taking his orders from God the admiral. The elders and deacons are the crew, and the passengers are the congregation. The ships are never perfect, and there are always a few leaks. Some passengers are quick to point out the leaks, and they can always tell you how to fix them. And if the captain doesn't take their advice, they will jump ship while others are creating more leaks by drilling holes that they think will let the water out. But in reality, they're just making it worse. There are also those that don't think the leaks are bad and are content to just play in the water and float around in it because they are oblivious to any issues. But there are a few that will say, Captain, tell me what you need, and I am willing to help in any way that I can. So which one are you? Are we willing to get behind the vision that Pastor Josue has laid out for us and will continue to lay out for us and do whatever it is that he needs us to do to make this happen? We have to work together to bring this transformation. The book of Acts lays out the blueprint for explosive growth and transformation of our city. 
After they were called, all the great names we read about in Acts spent time being prepared by simply following their mentors. They just followed their mentors around. Even Paul spent time with Barnabas in Antioch learning his trade. God wants us to know today that his desire for this church or for his church is that it should spread until the entire creation bows before Jesus. We are using Acts as an anchor scripture for three reasons. First, as I had said, it contains what the early church considered to be the last will and testament of Jesus. And second, this text contains the prime directive of the church or what can be called the basic law of congregational life. This law is the reality that churches grow when they intentionally reach out to others and churches die when all they do is take care of themselves. And how can the scriptures be any clearer than that text? Jesus says, be my witness. The basic law of congregational life challenges congregations with the primary reasons churches decline. Self-centeredness and feelings of entitlement. This text is a reminder that life does not revolve around us or our church. The third reason for using Acts is that the text lies, uh, lays the foundation for all and any authentic power within Christianity, and that's the Holy Spirit. It's not until we're filled with the Spirit that we're able, with God's help, to move our church forward into an impossible journey. What we're to accomplish won't be our doing, but the Holy Spirit working through us. Yes. So the ever-widening circle, we can scale this back and take it a little more intimate. And I didn't make a uh, diagram for that. But first, we are to witness to Jerusalem. We can take Jerusalem to be this church, FFCC. To be clear, reaching out to the world in no way minimizes the importance of our church. Our church is the center of the impossible mission. Second, we are to witness to Judea. Judea was the area of the world that surrounded Jerusalem. So this can represent the area around our church. Third, we are to witness to Samaria. The Samaritans were the outcasts of their day. They were people nobody wanted. They were half-breeds, according to the Jews. So Jesus is telling us we aren't the church until we reach out to the unloved and unwanted of our day. Fourth, we are to witness to the world. The ends of the earth were never reached in Acts. The goal of Christ's legacy is never completed. A willingness to share our faith depends on how devoted and obedient we are to Jesus. There's two imperatives here. Devotion to Jesus and obedience to Jesus. Obedience is just a natural result of devotion. If we're devoted to him, we're going to be obedient to him. We have to look inward to look outward. We need to repent of our feelings of entitlement because we are members. And we need to learn to be servants because we are redeemed. Let me say that again. We need to repent of our feelings of entitlement because we are members. And we need to learn to be servants because we are redeemed. Fast, explosive growth, it's biblical. God expects our church in the kingdom to grow and grow and grow. We know that those present on the day of Pentecost were about 1,200. In Acts 2.41, it says that 3,000 were baptized and added to their number that day. In Acts 4.4, it says that 5,000 men were added. They didn't count the women or children there. Probably a lot more. 
I'm going to run through some other scriptures and acts here real quick. 247 says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 514, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. 61, now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number. 67, the number of God kept on spreading and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. 931, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. Acts 11:21, and the hand of the Lord was with them and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. 11:24, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. Acts 16:5. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. That uh, scripture came to mind that Beth brought up uh, in, uh, um, on New Year's Eve when we were in here and had our celebration together. Amos 9.13. I hadn't heard that one in a long time and uh, that started stirring in me. Amos 9.13 says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. There's a harvest out there that's ripe and ready, but the workers are few. There's a whole bunch of workers sitting right here but are we willing to go out and do what it takes? Are we real, willing to go out and risk embarrassment because maybe we don't know exactly what to say or how to say it? You know, the Holy Spirit, it's in me, is in you. And he'll give us the words to say. He will operate in us and through us. Put yourself in the situation and see what happens. I think you'll be surprised. You know, I've, there's been different times I've been on the phone and talking with my sister about things she's going through or talking with somebody else, and things will just pop out that I didn't plan to say. I know where they came from. I know that there's seeds that were planted down in me over the years of, you know, 26 years of sitting in this room right here and listening to great preaching, and those words get put down in you. And you think you may not know them, but they will come to you when you need them. The Holy Spirit will bring them right back up in you. It's also in our times when we're outside of here. Yes, we come together here so that we can be, have something new that maybe we didn't think about to chew on for the week. But throughout the week, we need to be reading. We need to be daily, first thing in the morning. Read a couple of chapters. If you don't have time for that, read a chapter. If you don't have time for that, even the little Bible app on my phone has verse of the day. Even if it's a single verse, that's a seed that you're planting down in your heart. It's a logos, which will bring, say it, rhema. It is the written word of God that will bring the spoken word of God through the Holy Spirit back to you at another time. We have to be doing that on a daily basis. Biblical growth requires deep commitment. Reaching out to the unchurched and personal conversion. And I mean a conversion on the inside of yourself. Not just a conversion of the people we're trying to reach. And don't get weird with that. I don't mean that you're not already saved. I just mean converting the way of your thinking and your mind to be in the way that he thinks. So how can we begin a movement that will transform our city? Where do we start? This kind of growth is dependent on those three things I just mentioned. Deep commitment, reaching out to the unchurched, and personal conversion. Transforming the city also requires an intense desire to reach out to those 
who have not yet responded to the good news. The transformation of the city requires a personal conversion of those who will lead the charge. Christians must develop relationships with people outside of their church. I don't want to step on Pastor Jeff's toes because I don't think that I'm over undermining what his message was a few weeks back about who are you hanging with because there are levels to that. But we still need to, we need to be out among those people because that's the only way. You know, I think the saying is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You can't get their ear if they don't trust you. We can't get caught up in so many committees and programs here in the church that by the time we're finished with the commitments to this or to the institutional church that we don't have time left over for relationships outside the church. We have to practice relational evangelism. People don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. Christians are called to do things that make us feel uncomfortable. I said this before, but God often asks us to do the very thing that challenges us the most. The church is chosen not because we are special. We are special because we are chosen to be a blessing to the world. We have to become backyard missionaries. The U.S. is less Christian today than in any other time in history. And missionaries have to do three things. They have to learn a new language, they have to learn a new culture, and they have to learn a new technology. If we're to reach our city... We must first understand how the non-believer in our city thinks, feels, and needs. That's why we need to spend more time with the unchurched people than we do with our churched friends. It's not about you or me. It's about the kingdom. God wants strong churches that can change society. The book of Acts shows us uh, that authentic Christianity is lived outward on the behalf of others, not inwardly. That to be authentic, the church has to be focused more outwardly than inwardly. The primary thrust of the church must be outward to the neighborhood, the community, and the world. Some things to learn from the book of Acts Strong churches challenge the evils of society. Strong churches use the culture in order to reach the culture. Strong churches grow and make no excuse for their growth. Strong churches know that being on the road to mission with Jesus is the primary ministry of the church. And finally, strong churches are prepared to suffer for the gospel. I was sitting around, I think it was Friday morning or yesterday morning. I think it was Friday morning. Um, There go the hands. Um, Just kind of meditating and and thinking about the message that God was giving me. And I just started to write stuff down. And I went into a bit of a rant. And um, I wrote it down because I knew I probably wouldn't remember it today when I got up here in front of you. We can't just sit around here waiting on the next move of God. We are the next move of God. We have been called to be his witness here in Newark, to Licking County, to Ohio, to these United States, and to the nations. 
We can't just sit back and worry about our survival. We need to go on the offensive for the kingdom. We need to be pressing into the calling that God has placed on this church body and not just meeting here every Sunday morning for a social club gathering. This building is just our garrison, our base of operations where we come to get equipped and then head out into battle. We're not a cruise ship bound for heaven, just sitting back, getting fat off the endless buffets and waiting for the next port of call. We are warriors on a battleship that is stationed right at the very gates of hell. We are the last line of defense and we are tasked with stopping the enemy from overrunning our city, our country, and our state. We need to be willing to, as Don Quixote sings, march into hell for a heavenly cause and reach the unreachable stars, not just live long and prosper. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that message. And if you want some more information within what that preaching was about, a good majority of that information came from this book by Bill Esom entitled Preaching for Church Transformation. If you want more information about Family of Faith Community Church, you can find us on our website at familyfaithcc.org or locate us on Facebook.